Andy Bellin, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I guess one thing I I just want to start off by asking you is, uh, or just to introduce you, like you're a guy who's led a handful of careers. You're an almost astrophysicist. You were an editor at the Paris Review. You're a journalist. You wrote a book called Poker Nation. Uh, and you're also a, a poker player. Um, what, which of these careers have you enjoyed the most of the many that you've led and continue to lead? Um, I think to sort of say like the, the career itself was more appealing than any other. I, I think this is so much more dependent on like where I was in my life. Mm. So when I look back at my career and all the, you know, I, I just sort of aspired to finding a, a more public stage upon which to fail. And I just kept trying to, to do that over and over again. Um, a couple, I think the sort of perfect storm of events that led me to the Paris Review and the group of people that were there for that generation, um, it was like the greatest, you know, four years of my life. And it couldn't have shaped me better, couldn't have trained me better. Um, so, you know, that was incredibly satisfying. Poker was really interesting because when I started playing high stakes poker, there were only a, you know, a handful of people who had played a, a million hands of, of poker in their lives. Right. Mm. And they were all well known. It was the Doyle Brunsons and, and Stu Ungers and all of that. But for somebody like me who had played so much more poker than everybody else and everybody was just diving in because the poker boom had just started and the fuse was lit by Jim McManus's book and the fact that you know you could now put a, a lipstick cam and, and see people's cards. Yeah. Um, so many people were playing and I could not believe how bad most most players were back then. So right. when I would sit down at a table, I was a legit 60, 65% favorite. So it's funny, I, I had a friend who sort of kept my books for me early on when I was playing really high stakes in LA. And he was like, Do you, there was like a period where I won 35 games in a row. And it's, like that's just unthinkable. I mean, that's like you know. Let's say I'm a six percent favorite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just unthinkable. Um, but then, because of the rise of online poker and the fact that poker became so prevalent, and the sort of salacious patina in which it was covered was no longer um, associated with the game, and it came out of the basements and back rooms and into fancy people's homes. Mm. Everybody started playing enough, and you know, poker doesn't take a very long time to get much better. I mean, you may not become extraordinary, but you can go from bad to good in a couple of weeks. Um, it, it was like this, this golden Goldilocks period of like seven, eight months where I was winning everything and it was awesome. Um, <laughs> and then the wheels came off and people caught up and then I became sort of a, you know, a B plus C, C player. Like it was, so he's got degrees, Andy. Uh, <laughs> I'll, you know, it. it's funny now to, to play and sort of have to remind myself to play well because it's also one of those things where um, people become incredibly complacent with how good they've gotten. Right. And it's like, that's my game. Mm. And it's like somebody with a hinky golf swing. It's like, take the three months to like get that, that, that like little hitch out of your swing and you'll become a better player. And most people don't do that. Mm. So most people are completely comfortable with like, that's my game. It's got holes in it, but you know, I'll keep playing it. So um, I have to remind myself to be a better poker player a lot these days. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of try and um, resurrect those feelings of like, I'm surrounded by an all powerful winning force kind of thing. Yeah. So I suppose it depends why, why you're playing. I mean, poker, they're what your goals are. Poker is sort of one of those things. I imagine I, I don't personally play myself. It's like tennis where you can kind of play your whole life or golf. Yeah. Um, and some people are, as you've said and alluded to, very content with just sitting down and they, they like playing the game. It's a social thing. They want to hang out with their friends. You know, guys, you know, guys will have 
Friday night poker at, at Jim's house or whatever, where they watch a football game and then play poker. Um, and then there's other people who are really playing for the thrill and the competition. So there probably are a handful of people who don't want to get better. They just like yeah, they're they're playing it. <laughs> they're there for the company. They're there for the camaraderie. It is. It's very rare where you get a group of, and it's still this way. It's you know ninety percent guys. There's an occasional woman who drifts through, but you know guys of your demographic, of your age, of your income bracket, um, where you have an unencumbered period of time in which you can talk about anything. Right. You can talk about you know your marriage, your divorce, your health problems. Like, yeah. You know, we, it's funny because I've been playing the same group with the same group of guys, give or take for 30 years and where the games were filled with conversations about who we're dating and where we're traveling and the drugs mm -hmm. we're doing and the sort of <laughs> aspirational ideas of where our careers are heading. And now we talk a lot about colonoscopies and, you know, you know <laughs> echocardiograms and things and um, and it's funny because you'll mention something. It's like, oh, Jesus, I just had that, and it's like, okay, so yeah. now I, now we're we're back in the the community of like minded, you know, uh, sufferers. Yeah. So, uh, but it poker has been, um, while I wouldn't call it the sort of my favorite period of my life, it was the most consistent um, entree to any aspect of a new environment that I had ever been exposed to. So anytime I went somewhere new, anytime mm. I was in a new city or whatever, you can find a game and instantly become ingratiated into a community. And then now you've got a guy who's got your phone number and mm. like, it, it's the best, it, it, it was the best entree for me to Hollywood. You know, that's sort of how I got an agent and how I sort of have a, you know, a B-list writer career is like just <laughs> You're the modest. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I like poker was sort of a superpower. It was great. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how much it sounds like you can learn about first of all, about a person, but about a city, about uh, a place, an industry, all these kinds of things just from sitting across a poker table. Because the business of poker, it sounds like, you know, is sort of figuring things out about people and then people share things about themselves and you're always constantly evaluating. Like, what better way to learn about something new than to sit down and play a game where you're constantly being evaluated and evaluating not just everyone around you, but like everything around you as well. Yeah, the there there's a group of guys that we were in. You know, we were, we would go to different tournaments together, and it's really funny because you can take a, a random sampling of of people off the street and be like, "What's your experience on the Champs Elysees?" And they'll be like, "Oh God, you know the Obelisk," or it's like, "Oh, that's right by the George Sank," or it's like, "Oh, you know that's where the original La Dure was." And of my group, everybody would be like, oh, the, you know, the aviation club. Like, yeah. That's, it was on the Champs-Élysées where the, the French, you know, the, the big Parisian club was. And like, we all discovered the, you know, the hotels around there because they were across the street and were such right. degenerates that we couldn't like dare to take the metro somewhere. So it's like <laughs> we needed to walk to the club. Yeah. And thankfully it was in the middle of the best district in, you know, in Paris. But like, that's how, how we as uh, as sort of misfit poker players all found these little pockets and communities um, in all these various cities. Like, you know, the uh, in Australia, the, you know, what was the cave casino? And it's just like, there were, it's, it's always the best um, for me, the best way to sort of get introduced into a place when I'm there for the first time. Absolutely. On the subject of, uh, learning things from the game. I guess one thing I want to ask you is, you know, what are some lessons from the poker table that you have applied to your life? Or what are some lessons, you know, uh, just from the game of poker that people can apply to their lives in general? I think you have an uncommon familiarity with the game. You've played it over many years. Um, so not just, you know, if you're losing, get up and leave, or when the chips are down, stick it out, that kind of thing. Um, but 
what are some things you've really learned from the game that you've applied to other aspects of your life? So uh, f- when it was interesting when I when I first wrote Poker Nation, um, and it was sort of a surprise, you know, big selling book. Um, I started, and this is almost you know pre. Uh, this is way pre social media, but almost pre email <laughs> like <laughs> i would get letters in the mail yeah from random people who was like i found my grandson reading your book and i read your book and i don't play poker but it really helped me connect with either him or her or it it's interesting that i took this aspect of what you were talking about and applied it to you know my marriage or something and there it despite um the sort of notorious origins of poker and the association with gambling and everything salacious contained within, there is incredible life wisdom at the table. Mm. And like what? So uh, it, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm having the weird experience that my oldest son, Lucky, um, who's now 10, incredibly bright kid and, um, you know, in both good and bad ways, very similar to me, has started playing poker and is playing with his friends and um, uh, has asked me to sort of teach him. And it's, you know, part of me really wants him to excel at this. And then part of me is like, maybe you should learn Mandarin. Yeah. Maybe there's other ways (laughs) to spend your time. But there are circumstances at a poker table that present themselves that when you apply to your sort of infrastructure of your real life, you can learn a lot. And that, so for example, uh, I was playing a couple of weeks ago in LA and not to get too deep in the sort of geeky woods. No, but, please, but, please um, get deep in the geeky woods, <laughs> um, get into the forest. Um, I was, I was dealt, a, uh, I was dealt a pair of eights and then the flop comes out, uh, eight jack ace and there's no flush draw on the board and basically like it's as as good as it gets for me right like anybody with an ace thinks their ace is great like pray to god somebody's got an ace and a jack and they're going to lose all their money and i bet and he raised i called i checked the turn was a blank and i checked and he bet and i moved all in and he snap called and he had pocket jacks. So he had three jacks. I had three eights and I lost, I don't know, X number of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or whatever. But I I could not have played that hand better. So despite the result, I played the hand properly. So there are times when you're at the poker table and theoretically, the idea is that you are supposed to, and this is you know, something that's discussed in every book is that you are supposed to maximize profits and minimize losses. Sure. Yeah. So if I have ace jack and you've got ace 10 and it's an ace blank board, I have to figure out how much I can get from you. If you were willing to lose, you know, two grand on that hand and I only got a thousand from you, I didn't win. I, yes, I won the thousand dollars, but I left money on the table. And in a sense, in that proposition, because you know, in the infinite number of poker hands that are dealt, you're going to have ace jack and I'm going to have ace 10. And, you know, the situation will be reversed. And the question is, who played the hand better? So even though we played the exact same hands and we played them against each other and you won one and I won one, the person who played it better maximized uh, profits and minimized losses, Mm. even though it was a break-even scenario, won money. So you can go to a game and play perfect poker and lose $5,000, but somebody else given your hand will have lost $10,000. And as weird as it sounds, you have to then say to yourself, oh, I played really well. Yeah. And you can come home at, you know, after a, a, a session of, you know, X number of hours and say, oh, I, I you know, I won $1,800. But if you didn't maximize profits, you should have won $3,000. And because it's an infinite game and there's, um, 
you know, the probability says you're going to be in that scenario again, like you are then a losing poker player because somebody else would have created a, a, a more profitable situation. So that in, instead of becoming so results oriented and particularly in a binary way of win and loss, mm. um, you have to apply it to, to sort of what was the potential. So it's sort of, you know, for guys who are in, and this is a, you know, a very pokery conversation, but guys who are sort of like in marriages that are okay, yeah, but they're still in their marriage and like they are making it function, but they are not making it function as well as they can, or they're not accepting that this is a, like an unfortunate scenario. They're just sort of used to sort of cruising along and mm. the idea that even in a scenario that is a win, like I'm still married, you can make it better. Right. So there's a way to say like, do not focus on the binary reality of like the box is checked and I'm still married yeah. as like something that's a successful notion, like go do, go do it better. Yeah. Um, so these are, these are things that I sort of try and apply to life that they're, you know, like that hand is, is, you know, what we would call a cooler hand where you are designed to manifest destiny when the cards were shuffled and dealt, you're going to lose all your money. Yeah. And you have to accept that as that is, you know, that that's why they gave you the batting helmet. Like occasionally a pitch is going to hit your head, but the, the, you know, th then the task for you becomes, can I not let that affect my play? And it's interesting because there's a phenomenon, there's a big chip phenomenon at poker where it's like you sit down, you win your first two hands and now everybody else has got 3,000 and you've got 8,000. It's like, oh, I'm a tough guy. I'll start betting and raising and making people uncomfortable because I can absorb their stacks. That's easy to do. Like anybody can can play, you know, big stack poker. It's like, it's like having a first date in Venice. Like if you're not happy and getting laid and it's not the time of your life, like it's, you know, that's the easy part. It's like what happens when you come home is when things get difficult. So, you know, if you get a cooler hand on your first hand and you've got, you know, five more hours to play poker and you're already a thousand dollars down or ten thousand dollars down, however, whatever stakes, if you can remain composed and just feel like I'm starting the game fresh and not focus on that gnawing reality of I'm already a thousand dollars down. Yeah. That's part of sort of being a successful poker player. And it's also being a successful businessman of not mm. saying like, shit, I bought that stock at 40. It's now 20. It's like, do you want that stock at 20? And instead of focusing on I'm, you know, I'm X number of dollars in the hole. Can you objectively evaluate the scenario so that your your actions are going to be dictated by the right amount of information that that is leading you to the proper decision. Yeah. And it's really interesting you watch guys who play poker at my house, you know, once twice a week for years. And this it's a phenomenon common at every poker table where players accelerate their aggression towards the end of the evening if they're down. The whole phenomenon of being on tilt, so to speak. Well, so being tilted is one thing, but these guys are trying to get even. Ah, they don't want right, to go right, home to make and up say, their, yeah, 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 I lost a hundred dollars. Mm. And the idea that poker is an infinite game. Mm. And if you stop saying, oh, I broke at this moment, right? Am I, I won 3000 last week, but I'm down a hundred and something in, um, in a very fragile ego says, I can't stand the idea that I've lost. Yeah. So you take risks that are unnecessary and unbeneficial and are unlikely to result in something profitable <laughs> just so you can walk home saying like, oh no, no, I got even. It's like, yeah. it's a hundred dollars, man. Like do, do, don't affect your play. And that becomes sort of a death cycle where you see these guys on the last round just start just pumping money. It's like, even Great. right, and that happens in um, in tournament poker a lot. And there are a couple of guys, guys like Eric Seidel and Phil Ivey, who recognize this phenomenon. Where if you're uh, so in poker tournaments, basically, if they're a thousand dollars, they pay out uh, usually the top ten percent of the people. Yeah. So a thousand players. If you're if you're the eight hundred ninety ninth person knocked out, you get zero. If you're, you know, the 900th person knocked out, you get your, I don't know, 
$3,000 back or $700 back. So they announce like how many players are left. And when it gets close to the bubble, that, that moment where you're going to actually make the money, everybody in the room freezes. Nobody plays a hand. Nobody wants to be the one who busts. And like being the bubble boy is absolutely the worst thing that can happen. You're the guy who stands up and it's like, had I just folded that hand? So the really good poker players start getting incredibly aggressive towards the bubble, knowing that everybody's only going to play their premium hands. Right. So there's so much money to be made in, in tournament equity by being aggressive towards the bubble because so many people are playing passively. Yeah. So, and it's that whole thing of like, now look at your life. Like you flew to Vegas, the buy-in is $700. Like, is that $700 going to make a difference to you? Mm. Because if it isn't, like, then play your game because this is when everybody's playing tentatively. So it's also sort of trying to trying to take the ego out of I, I made my money back yeah. as opposed to I am trying to win the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. I think of all the things you've just said, what, what sticks out to me the most is this concept of the infinite game. Poker is an infinite game and so is life. And a lot of times we get really hung up on the short-term wins and losses, uh, you, you know, within a day, within an hour, within whatever in our, you know, it, particularly with work and jobs and then relationships, career, you know, all, all, all kinds of stuff. I think of um, this scene from A Bronx Tale, a, a, a film, if you're familiar with it. I am. Um, and there's that there's that famous scene where Sonny is is talking to the kid, um, and it's, it's I call it like the twenty dollar scene. Um, the kid I, f I forget the the name of the character is all upset that he's he's loaned another person in the neighborhood twenty dollars, and every time he sees the guy, the guy refuses to pay him his twenty dollars back, and he's talking with Sonny, who's his mentor. Um, and Sonny says, do you even like this guy? And the kid goes, no, I don't like him at all. And Sonny goes, great, you know, you've paid $20 to, to get some loser out of your life, to get this toxic guy out of your life. Um, that's that's the fee you paid and now you're, you're better off without this guy who brings nothing into your life. And so there's this idea, I think sometimes where we, we can't stand the loss we're, we're, we're trying to, as you said, towards the end of the poker game, break even or, or, or somehow make up for whatever it is that we think we've lost. But in reality, we, you know, we, we didn't do that, that badly, or we, we've moved the needle a little bit. I mean, I, you know, experiences when I was writing my, my first book, um, sometimes I would be kicking myself at the end of the day, because I didn't get through as much writing as I wanted to, or because what I had wrote last night while drinking scotch that I thought was brilliant wasn't so brilliant when the sun came up. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> um, you know, it's know it's like feeling. the the uh, the genius feeling that we have um, sort of fades away with the darkness of the night, and then we wake up and we realize, oh wow. This is trash. <laughs> I can't do anything with this. I've like, been there. Yeah. Um, the 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 thing that you also have to recognize, and it's really weird to do the math of of poker um, in a really objective way. But I, I found this out early on in my poker career that um, there are very few profitable poker players out there. Right. And it's sort of the the 1849 phenomenon where it's like what's what's the, yeah. the where they the 49ers would go out to strike it rich and um you know the, the idea was that it really isn't the guys panning for gold in the river who get rich mm. but it's the guys who sells sell the picks and shovels yeah and those are the guys who are making money yeah. everybody else is just a, a sort of like a, a statistical sucker. underdog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, some people strike it rich, but for the most part, the money is being sucked out of the system. Yeah. And poker, whether you're playing at a, you know, at a VA or at a, at a casino or online, there's always a rake. Even in my home game, 
I don't rake, but could you define we, what a rake is? For uh, a rake is know? is an X number of dollars that are taken out of uh, out of a pot. So mm -hmm. if you're playing, it's a, a security measure. You know, so the 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 dealer at the casino will either charge you time, so every hour they take five dollars from you, or if the pot is a hundred dollars, they take five dollars or whatever it is. So there's money. It's not a zero sum game, right? So it's a, it's a decreasing uh, sort of revenue that you are you're competing for. Mm. So it starts out with everybody buying in a thousand dollars. So there's you know supposedly nine thousand dollars at the table, but everybody's given away five dollars for the first half hour, and then so now you're playing for forty five dollars less, and then there's less and less money on the table. So even in my poker game, we have a dealer and we tip the dealer, and she ends up making you know, $100 a, an hour basically. Mm. And so we play for five hours and basically everybody has handed in $50 to play poker for free. Right. Right, for the for the convenience of not having to shuffle cards and worry about who's misdealing or anything. So n to break even, you have to be, a, you know, a 5% favorite so that you know, just looking at it mathematically, like, you know, most people at the table are going to lose money. Right. And that's the phenomenon across poker. Mm. And um, it's really interesting, but we were talking earlier about when, when the pandemic happened and we finally figured out, uh, my, my group of guys finally figured out after a couple of months, a way to sort of resurrect our poker game on an app and then zoom and sort of everybody was so happy to see each other and play. Um, and then all of these online uh, games started popping up. And at first everybody was playing for free. And then a couple of people started figuring out like, oh, I'll just charge, you know, $20 to sit down. And a guy we knew, a uh, pretty smart guy, just said, I'm just going to start running a game every night. And charging, I don't remember what it was, whether it was 20 or 40 or a hundred dollars to play. And he was kind of shocked that he was making a, like a ton of money out of this. And he had said to me, well, you know, I, I, I'm happy this is going on, but he said, you know, it's in six months, this will be over. I said, why? And he was like, because I'm the big winner. Like, yeah. I don't play and I'm the big Picks winner. Picks and shovels. So he's taking money out of the game. The resources are going to dry up. The game's going to go away. And it has a, a, you know, a finite existence. Yeah. So that's where poker is very weird is that even when you're at a friendly game, whether you're playing for dinner or the, the dealer or whatever, like it's very hard to be a profitable poker player. Yeah. It's a good, I mean, I guess you have to accept that Going in, it used to be the case in Formula One where, you know, there was that great movie Rush that came out and I think it was 2013 um, about the 1976 season and James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. There's another great book called um, The Limit by Michael Cannell, a journalist mm -hmm. about Wolfgang von Tripps and some of those guys that were old uh, Formula One drivers yeah, yeah. back in, in the 60s. Um, and so, uh, you know who these people are. So... Um, there, it, it used to be common knowledge that you know drivers would die every year. You would start off the season, and then you'd have X number of drivers starting out. I don't remember how many it was back then, 25 maybe, 30, or just between 20 and 30, I guess. Um, and some people wouldn't make it to the end of the season. They would perish. Personally, I'm of the opinion, and I'll say on the record, that I would like death to be part of formula one again i think it's got we don't have to hash this out but i think it's gotten far too safe i think the technology has gotten too sophisticated you have the halos all, you know and i liked it when the formula one drivers died because there was an element of thrill and glory to it um and there was an element of incurring risk. You are inherently incurring risk. I think also the driving was more pure back then. Now I think technology plays too big of a role in it. Who has the better car um, or who has the more sophisticated suspension system? Um, that's sort of a, a, a side note. The, the point of this little diatribe that I'm making <laughs> is that all the drivers would start off at the beginning of the season knowing that 
some of them would die, that they, they may well die. And when you sit down at a poker table, I guess you have to accept that statistically you probably will lose money because, or you probably will yeah, you're probably lose, lose money. you know, maybe you're advancing yourself in the infinite game, you're, you play your hands as best you could, but no, everybody can't walk away from the poker table up. It doesn't work like that statistically. It's it's uh, that's, it's not possible. Yeah. So we, I mean, we. The analogy is everybody thinks they're good in bed. Yeah. And um, you know, just anecdotally, you'll again. I think the statistics are right on. Like sixty percent of poker players are losers, and I assume most you know sixty percent of people don't know what they're doing. So it's. Um, it's a good analogy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny bringing up the the technology aspect um, sort of in sports and poker because the when technology started to infiltrate poker, when, when you could start playing online, it seemed like this, this almost like this emancipatory moment where all of the things that had prevented you from seeking out the game you loved so were suddenly taken mm -hmm. away and you could find a game anytime you wanted. And in the same way that the, the sort of algorithmic manifest destiny of every sport ends up ruining it where home runs and strikeouts have ruined baseball and the understanding that the three-point line is, is the only thing that matters in the NBA not only do you sort of lose the individual uh, aspects of each team being interesting and each player being interesting where there used to be NBA teams that were, um, you know, low post oriented or motion oriented, like it's now all the exact same thing and it becomes iterative in a sense. Like the algorithms started collecting information on people's play in poker and now there is what we have found out a sort of optimal strategy to play. And in the same way, like if you, in the eighties, when they first started the senior PGA tour, you go back and you'd watch these weird old golfers like Chi Chi Rodriguez and stuff. They used to tee the ball up like that high and they would all have these hinky swings because they were homemade swings that they made in their garage. And then, you know, the Phil Mickelson's came in and then everybody learned the swing from the same DVD. Yeah. So then it, it became, everybody conformed to what was the most productive path. Um, a lot of the subtleties and individualities of poker play have become lost to the algorithm. So right. most people play very similarly. You have found an extraordinary benefit to aggression and it's, kind of taken a lot of the fun out of the game for me and, and also taken a lot of my advantage away. Do you ever throw a wrench into the gears and do something you know you're not supposed to do just to fuck with someone? Well, I mean, in a sense, that's optimal play, right? So that the expression is that there's, you don't really lose money. You on can't it. play as a robot. Right. No. You don't lose money on a bluff because when you turn over your bluff, that is an advertisement for the idea that next time you bet with a winning hand, somebody should call you because- They've seen you bluff. Um, and the really good analytical poker players will say he raised in this position. You know, and last time he did that, he had this cards. There was a caller behind him. He, he made this ratio bet. And you can sort of pathologize through the actions, like a, a range of hands to put him on or her right. on. Um, and uh, a lot of that is now sort of baked into almost every player's strategy. So being able to do something completely out of the ordinary is almost essential to not being a, a too predictable player. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Another thing I wanna dig into when we were talking about before is this concept of being able to win by losing. So it plays out at a few levels. On one level, you know, it's an infinite game, you're moving the needle, you may not have maximized your profits, but you minimized your losses. You played the hand as as well as you could. But another thing I guess people should keep in mind is that every person, it sounds like, I mean, this is your world, not mine, but it sounds like every person 
goes to the poker table um, with different intentions. Maybe not the guys you play with every week, um, but if you go to a new game, you may not necessarily know immediately why people are there. Some guys, I'm sure, particularly in the entertainment industry, just like hanging around celebrities or say, I played poker with XYZ. Some guys might like, you know, the networking aspect of it. They are paying, they know that they're going to lose money. They set a cap on how much money they're going to lose, say $10,000 because they're a shit poker player. And they go there for the sole purpose of networking and making connections. And they're like, I've paid a $10,000 fee for an introduction to XYZ. Yep. Um, or XYZ, as they say in Australia. Um, other guys may go to the poker table, as we said before, because, you know, they're they're not partial to the idea of a therapist and they just want to chat with some strangers in a bar they'll never see they'll never see again. Other guys might go to the poker table because they're addicted to gambling. Other guys might go because they like the social aspect. I guess everyone I mean there's this I'm interested in this idea of like these some of these shrewd guys, I'm sure, and girls will go to a poker table knowing that they're gonna lose, but they've lost money, but they accomplished whatever their goal was, which perhaps meeting this person um, who will be a good business contact for them, or maybe they just were enamored with the idea of playing with, you know, I, I played poker with this famous person. Yeah, the the it's the same thing you were talking about from Bronx Hill, the $20, like, there are so many ancillary benefits to it, whether it's the therapeutic process, whether it is the the sort of soothing of seeing other people of of your demographic um, ilk, you know, in similar situations. It's that sort of um, uh, Boston Commons sort of community ground of mm. like let's all meet here and then sort of tell tales of our of our travels abroad. So there's a community aspect. There's a social aspect, there is a networking aspect, there is a star fucker aspect, there's, there are so <laughs> many <Starfucker. laughs> reasons why, uh, why people sit down. And the truth is that um, probably for, for home poker games, 80% of it is not money. Right. And it's interesting because I, I've had this game that I've shared with a, a couple of people for, I guess, almost 30 years now. I keep thinking that. Um, it's so stunning. And the like, the only rule we have is like, you know, well, you know, be interesting and, uh, and you're not there trying to make money. Right. Like you want to win. But you're not you're not grinding somebody. You're not trying to hurt somebody. You're not trying to make sure they can't you know pay their kids' private school tuition. Like nobody wants anybody to get hurt. Yes, I want to beat them all. And you know there are a couple of guys who I love dearly who when they lose it, it brings me joy to the likes of which I cannot describe. Right. But um, the least important part of it for most of us is the idea of making money. Right. Like that's not what we're there. We're there for the therapy. We're there for the camaraderie. We're there for the um, the break from the, you know, the bliss of domestic life. Like we're 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 there for other reasons. Um, and I would say that everybody, ninety percent of the people at a at a poker table, even in Vegas, are ex exercising some sort of demon. Whether they're punishing themselves, whether they're substituting, <laughs> uh, you know, the masochists at the table. Yeah, sure. Like I deserve to lose. You see those guys. Can you tell um, when you sit down? How quickly does it become apparent that this guy's here so he can meet investors? This guy's here because he's a masochist. This guy's here because you know he just had a fight with his wife. And this guy's here because he's, in your words, a star fucker. I like that word. It's a good word. Um, but how quickly it, can you figure out um, people's game? You know, not not poker, but like what what their 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 motivations. It, it's pretty apparent. I mean, there are times when you're at a table and there's a you know a guy who won't stop stop asking questions, and then there are guys who are are so clearly. Um, playing overly aggressively and it seems like 
they are determined to lose everything they have and that guy is you know punishing himself for being a shitty dad or you know doing whatever, whatever. um it it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly mm. um and that's i mean that's always been some of the more appealing aspects of poker is the sort of the psychological endeavors of everybody you're in contact with right and it's it's sort of my fa my favorite part of the game and I, there's a line in Poker Nation that like, uh, you know, the only thing stranger than a poker player is the guy sitting next to him. And that's always been, um, you know, my favorite aspect of it. Although, you know, in truth is particularly at a, like a table in Atlantic City or, or Las Vegas, 80% of the people are there are boring as shit. So, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. But, um, you know, watching somebody achieve their goal whether it is losing all their money, whether it is, um, you know, trying to just get out of the house and have somebody to talk to and listen, listen to their stale, their tales of woe. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned in the games that you play in, you know, your one rule is you're not, you're not playing to win. You're not trying to, or you're not going out of your way to, uh, hurt someone or to be mean. And perhaps you've, and can't answer this question because you know some of these people or all of them. Um, but so I'm asking more generally, not about the specific circumstance. In the film Molly's Game, um, which I don't know how historically accurate it is. I haven't looked into it. Um, there's the, the the portrayal of w one of the protagonists, Player X, is that he gets off on fucking people, basically. Um, or there's that line, like, I like to destroy people's lives. So without naming names or even talking about this particular circumstance, um, do you ever find in a poker game that there are like mean people who, you know, get off on like punishing other, they like, you know, hurting, they like to hurt. So, uh, you know, Molly's game was a, was a, f like a really fun period of my life for a very short period of time because that was sort of the golden age of poker in LA and everybody was playing and there hadn't been a third party that had taken out money from the game yet. So everybody was whole and healthy and happy and it was fun and we were young and it was cool. And I mean, I, I don't want to sound shallow, but it was awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, and you know, as to the specifics of the movie or whatever, like you know, rule, rule one of fight clubs, you don't talk about fight club, but, um, Fair enough. <laughs> you know, there are people who show up at a poker table with an extraordinary chip on their shoulder and the way they exercise that particular demon is, you know, the, it's a, a very pernicious application of the idea of I can do this to you. I am smart enough. I am powerful enough. I am cool enough, whatever it is. Right. I can take that from you. And there are people who um, have accelerated that to, you know, to going hyperbolic, which is just like, like, I want to take it all from you. Like there are guys I have met who have seen people's lives fall apart because they've lost so much at poker and it brought them tremendous satisfaction that I can change that guy's life. It, uh, it sounds it's not very nice. Uh, there, it just, it's there, not, not right or wrong, black or white, it just is. You know, yeah. I don't think it's very specific to poker. I think there's a schadenfreude to all of us. And I, yeah. I don't remember if it was like Kurt Vonnegut or whoever said like, it's not enough to succeed. You have to see your friends fail. <laughs> um, but you know, there was, it is. And it's, it's not like, everyone plays like this either. These no, are just, it's, it's just a, something it's that you see in the same way that you see weird shit on the subway sometimes. Like, so I, I had written a, a movie a long time ago in 2009 about, uh, about a young woman who was the victim of an internet predator and oh, um, uh, trust with yeah, 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 and yeah. Catherine Keener and Viola Davis. And, um, I did a ton of research and met with a, a bunch of FBI guys and worked uh, with the Rape Treatment Center in, in LA. 
And we were talking about the phenomenon of pedophilia. And what they had said to me was that you can take any one of these handful of jobs that gives you access to young people, whether it's a coach or a priest or a teacher or a camp counselor, whatever Chase, it is. Yeah. And across the board, it is because you have put yourself in that position. It was something like 6% of those people are, are sick. They have a disease. And it didn't matter if it was a priest or a hockey coach, 6% of those people who have make it the, taken their life in a direction where they were exposed to children did so for nefarious reasons. Um, I don't think poker is, uh, is, is more of a sort of den of thieves than any other of these hyper competitive fields, whether it's finance or whatever. But I would say that it's probably 6% that there are 6% of the people there clinically detached enough to see success as somebody else's failure. Right. And I'm sure that's true in banking. I'm sure that's true in real estate. Um, so that, I mean, it, it's not it's not a phenomenon that is specifically reserved for poker players. It's can't, you know, my, my gain is your loss. And there are, are individuals who take that to you know an exponential degree to the point of i can take everything right where is this six percent statistic from by the way i don't remember where i got that but i don't remember if it was from the fbi or somebody gave me that statistic that it was something like it, you could go to any parish in in the world and six percent of the priests were pedophiles. or camp counselors or anyone in in something like that under whose charge there are uh, or who is who's in charge of of children something uh, like that that's no that makes sense um and i don't i don't as you said think that poker necessarily brings out things in people that aren't already there someone once told me um in another context uh this this girl i think was talking about um her boyfriend had you know he would act like an idiot when he took drugs um it was nothing like violent um there was no like sexual violence or physical violence or anything like that um but she's like oh well it's just uh it's just because you know he was really high um and my friend intervened and said no 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 drugs don't make people do anything you know like drugs don't make people do things people make people do things it's not bringing out anything that's not already there now of course you know you drop acid in the forest you're going to start hallucinating but i guess what i'm saying is that these behaviors you, you shouldn't misattribute them to drugs or to poker or sure. to anything it's it's the person at the end of the day is take personal responsibility and assign blame where where blame is due yeah so Poker in that way is this sort of fabulous either kaleidoscope or or litmus test where, you know, whatever, I, I forgot, maybe it's the Balinese shadow puppets where, you know, you're not looking at the light, but the absence of light, like you're, it, it's a great way to find somebody's spirit animal, like whatever they yeah. are. Um, and it, it's the same thing with, with alcohol or stress or you know, like what what really is beneath the the surface, and a lot of the times the content of the character is completely absent. Yeah, true, um, true. And I mean, to the extent that I can say it's true in other aspects of life, I can't yeah. say it's true because I've never played poker. <laughs> to be honest, um, what do you have to say, Andy, on the subject of taking your beatings like a man? Um, I'm not sure sure anybody gets great at uh at failing um but i would say like accepting the fact that just statistically you are supposed to lose a lot of the times and i i, I the Sorry, I'm going to really out myself for the nerd that I am, but um, there was a great Star Trek, <laughs> please, e please do. Star yeah. Trek episode where they, they bring up, um, and actually it might have been a, a movie, but the, they bring up the 
there's a test at Starfleet called the Kobayashi Maru. Yeah. And it's basically, it's a scenario under which you cannot win. Yeah. You can't save the people and save the whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they're not actually trying to watch you problem solve. They're watching how you cope with the failure. Right. And famously, Kirk was the one guy who beat the Kobayashi Maru because he went in and reprogrammed yeah. it or whatever. But there are certain um, scenarios in poker at the poker table in life where it's a fait accompli. You're, you're done. You're going to lose. When it's your time to die, you die. Yeah. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quite phrase it as taking it like a man. I would say um, don't make it unproductive. Like right. So uh, I, I describe in Poker Nation as somebody going on tilt when they start just playing irrationally and over aggressively and trying to make up for money that they lost like it's not their money anymore it's somebody else's money right so you don't you didn't, you're not losing now it's just you have a smaller stack of chips that's it um going on tilt is like playing in a tennis game and being so angry at your right hand that you've decided to play with your left hand and swing as hard as you can at every ball like it's just not going to work um but it's so common yeah, and, and it's, it's again, but then now you be, it becomes more of an a, like um, an esoteric sort of exploration of like why you're at the poker table, but because then you see the people who are punishing themselves, right? Um, but so if you can have a cooler hand where you've got you know uh, the nut flush and somebody river to straight flush, and you are a huge favorite, but this is going to happen to you. Like if you mm. play enough poker, you're going to see every combination of cards and bad beats. If you have enough composure to just be calm and say, okay, that happened. Now let me get back to my game. Then that is actually a productive strategy that's going to put you in a position because everybody else at that table is going to take a bad beat. And if they go fucking bananas when they go, um, you know, on tilt and, and get a bad beat, then it's your advantage you can take advantage of them and if you don't do that then there's the difference between maximizing profits and minimizing losses like any other person in that seat would now go ape shit and you don't so you have not you have minimized losses right so however you want to phrase it you know taking your beings like a man or whatever it is like if you can if you can separate the emotional reaction that is inherent in any one of these what what feels like cursed scenarios then you'll be a profitable player yeah just for the for the record i took that phraseology off of the product description for your book on amazon taking your beatings like i'm sure you didn't write that yourself or i don't know who I wrote probably that. didn't but I don't know <laughs> um, it was, it was written. but no i mean t t the the phenomenon you've described and and sort of how to deal with it makes makes a lot of sense um, have you ever, Andy, gotten up and just walked away from a poker game for X, Y, Z reason? Like the people weren't pleasant to be around or it was a dangerous situation or whatever. Don't need specifics. Yes. Like not enjoying the company happens all the time. Dangerous situation happens infrequently, but certainly happens. Um, what, with like firearms or something? Uh, you know, the in the underground clubs in New York City, there were... A, a number of unsavory characters. unsavory characters and you know they places had been robbed people had gotten shot like so you're also playing with guys that are occasionally volatile enough that it may lead to something else so yes i've walked away from tables where i was like don't want to be don't want that person in my life mm. basically um certainly have left because it's boring certainly have left a number of times where i did not feel like i could control the frustration from a bad beat yeah so that takes discipline though <coughs> i mean that's is everything we've been discussing yeah playing on tilt minimizing your losses if you're not in a right hat you wouldn't drive drunk you shouldn't play on tilt if you know yeah and you know. if you can't control the tilt then just get up and go and you'll play tomorrow or the next day or whatever so i i have done that many many times yeah um and also every once in a while like each game has its own dynamic and its own feel and it's this sort of um 
you know, if, if you try and pathologize the the mentality at the table, you can say, oh, that person is table captain and they're raising six, you know, six out of 10 hands and that person is a calling station and all this kind of stuff. I have sort of a sweet spot where I like to to drive a lot of the action. And if there's a guy who is dead set on just being table captain and he's three betting every time I raise or four betting my three bets and constantly putting me to a decision and he's got position on me, meaning like he's he's acting right after I am. Yeah. I'll get up and leave just because right. it's it's disadvantageous. Right. Um and unenjoyable. Yeah. There was a uh a friend of mine was telling me the story who's a who's great guy like one of the best poker players um on earth um antonio spendiari who's known as the magician he's like one of the greatest players but just an awesome guy and he has played so much poker and made so much money and gotten so good at the game that, like there is no scenario under which he should be uncomfortable at the table yeah and there's one player on earth and i feel the exact same way about the guy and i sort of like watched him go from somebody who didn't what's his name again sorry uh who antonio was playing uh, uh, or uh, antonio so antonio was playing against a, another guy named rick solomon mm -hmm. who um like when i first started playing with him i wouldn't play heads up with rick because he was so bad and i didn't want to take his money <laughs> but i was you know helping teach him you know this and that and he has become the most extraordinarily aggressive terrifying poker player on earth for cash um and like antonio <laughs> like saying he walked up to some you know million dollar buy-in and sat down and he just looked over and the person directly to his left who has the best position on him because he gets to see antonio act nine out of ten times or eight out of nine times spending how many people are at the table was rick mm. and he just kind of looked at the, somebody on the other side of rick and was like i will just hand you twenty thousand dollars to switch seats with me yeah. like he was willing to eat twenty thousand dollars to just not have rick have position on him right so there are uh you know there's situations where it's just it's not to your advantage yeah andy i want to ask um who enforces payment in these sort of scenarios if you're playing at an underground club in new york or la or where in rome wherever you're playing uh and you lose a bunch of money what's to stop you from just what nobody carries that much cash I, I don't imagine in their back pocket there's not enough room in your wallet for it um what's to stop say you lose a bunch of money what why can't you just get on a plane home the next day or fly to France the next day. I mean, I know there are unsavory characters in in this world and perhaps they'll they'll find you at your job or your home or perhaps your loved ones or friends or whatever. Um, but this, I mean, this isn't all like, and on the other hand of this, if you're playing with a bunch of guys and you don't pay what's owed, they probably won't, or not probably, they will not invite you back. Um, so how, this is all like a murky gray underground world. How is payment enforced? So most of the clubs, um, unless you were somebody who was known and known to have resources or whatever, you had to pay at the door basically. So if you were buying 10 grand, like you need to walk in with 10 grand. Um, where it gets- Ah, so you can't, lose more than or i mean but people loan each other money at the table yes and of course and yes there are a hundred terrible stories of guys skipping out on loans and things like that but where it gets weird is in in really big home games where somebody will say like oh look this is a friend of mine you know he played in the nfl he's a great guy like okay and there were a couple of times at, at molly's game where um there were two or three two or three different times where somebody just simply said, uh, and it was funny because they they couched it in sort of a justification of, you guys were cheating me. It's like, no, we weren't. You just got unlucky or you're yeah. a bad player or whatever. But we, uh, I remember one specific person who walked out on $60,000 and somebody else who walked out on something else. And the truth is like, 
what are we going to do about it? We're going to go beat up the guy? Like, But that, I mean, that does happen in some of these. Like you watch the movie Rounders, for example, like I mean, it's fiction, well, like, uh, or maybe Brian, be careful about what table you sit yeah, down at. Yeah, uh, I, I would say Brian Koppelman and David Levine had a, had probably the, the greatest most accurate depiction of New York poker, but that, that was sort of underground clubs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, for these big games, most of the time somebody walks out, you eat it. And right. it's funny, we had, um, I, like I said, I've had this poker game for 30 years, probably 200 people have come through, you know, from massage therapists to tax <laughs> attorneys to international celebrities. And, um, of all of these people, only one person ever uh, wouldn't pay us. And it was really interesting because we were all so shocked that it happened, that it finally happened to us. And it was not an extraordinary sum of money. It was like, I don't know, $5,000 or something. And at first he just disappeared. But I mean, he lives in New York and he's got a job and like, but he wouldn't go to any poker games. He dropped out of the fantasy football league and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was really interesting because I called him and left him a message. And I said, look, man, how about I loan you the money and we figure out a way. So, so you just pay me back over, let's say three years. Yeah. Just pay me back. Didn't get an answer. Then I called him and I said, look, you, you know, of that five grand, you owe me two. I'll walk away from the two. You just pay everybody else because it's yeah. important that the game has integrity, not a phone call. And we ended up having to, for the first time ever, like chop money out of the pot, rake the pot to pay everybody back over the course of a couple of months so that so that everybody shared uh, the the pain basically. But it was a really shitty feeling and it was also- What was his, was he going through a divorce or it is, he moved, um, I don't know, what was his justification? It, there wasn't- Or did he never it, call it back? Never, never got one. People have said that he's, you know, popped up at this poker game and that poker game. Was he was, a few screws loose or something? No, he was, he was just not, uh, I think he was just comfortable with, with being unscrupulous. Oh, oh, so, okay. And somebody basically said if it wasn't that hand, it it would have been another. He was going to take as much money as he could out of the game and then walk away one day. Ah, yeah. um, and it was interesting. There was like great justice in it because he had, <laughs> I mean, this is again, deep in the nerdy It was a woods. $20 situation. He wasn't a great guy to have around well, anyone. Anyway. Absolutely. But also yeah. um, he ended up winning a, a friend of ours fantasy football thing for like, you know, $3,000 and we called him and the guy gave us the money. <laughs> So that was, there was a little bit of justice for it. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Andy, what do you say? I mean, poker's, poker's a great game. There's a lot, uh, a lot you can learn from it. It's a lot of fun. There's also, I mean, I was asking, not, I don't want to get too hung up on the negative aspects of this, um, but you know, I'm sure you've seen, or you probably don't enjoy playing with this person because they're not very good anyway, or they, I wouldn't imagine they are. But what do you say to the guy who's, you know, walking in there, maybe he's drunk, maybe he's not like gambling with not just his money, but his wife's money and his kid's college fund and X, Y, Z, someone who really can't help themselves and who's not just endangering their own welfare but is is basically playing with other people's money um th like a, a person who's truly addicted to to gambling in australia you know um there's pokies machines everywhere and all the bars they're, they're, they're like slot machines and i see guys sitting in the poke i don't play them but you see guys yeah, they just they can't help themselves two in the morning smoking cigarettes yeah. um so the, the question being um poker is not always played for for the right reasons it's gambling in any form can be an addiction i don't know what, what do you have to say about this um it's you know it's not unlike any other substance which brings you pleasure who's sort of got inherent potential dangers in over use and, and lack of moderation like there's it's it's funny because um, actually, I don't know this to be true, but I think it's true. But I, I tend to say things like I know what I'm talking about. But um, yeah. I think the like the are you an alcoholic question are 
questionnaire is, you know, like, has drinking affected your reputation? Has it hurt somebody else? Has it caused you to lose uh, self-esteem? And I think they're the AA and GA, the Gamblers Anonymous, like they're the exact same questions. Yeah. Um, just take out, you know, alcohol for gambling. Um, so when you see somebody in the throes of something, it's really awful. And right. we talk about it. Uh, we, we had one friend who was playing a lot. And, you know, we actually asked him to stop playing because he was playing badly and he didn't have the money to lose that he was losing and we actually like had an intervention and it was like sending in the same way that you would with with someone abusing any other kind of substance yeah it's very difficult to walk into a table in 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 vegas and be like that guy's there punishing himself that guy's you know spending his church money but it, it happens all the time and you try very hard not to be around it um and although it is parasitic by nature like you you don't want to be taking somebody's money yeah. You know, when it's not theirs, there, there are all these stories of one of the Molly's games stories was um, a finance douche named um, <laughs> God, Brad. Fuck, I can't remember. Any Brad. Anyway, Brad something. Oh, from, from the movie, the hedge fund guy. Yeah. Or this is, yeah. Um, and Brad was. This is not his real name. All right. I, th I we actually don't think it was his or, real name. They called him Bad Brad in the movie. <laughs> and I think his name was Brad. Um, but any, anyway. Anyway, yeah. I, I only played with him two or three times, but he was playing with his client's money. Yeah. And it was amazing because a special master was appointed to try and claw back where the money went. And all of a sudden, guys from our poker What's a community, special master? What a is special it? master is somebody the court appoints to try and track down where all the Mer the Madoff money is. Oh, yeah, yeah, So yeah. Madoff's boat gets sold and his house gets sold yeah, and yeah. he's got $10 billion in debts and they raised $2 million. Yeah. They break it up, up pennies on the dollar to to repay the, the people whose money was stolen. And the special master found checks written by- Brad, I'm almost sure his name was Brad. Um, finance douche, Brad. Yeah, finance douche. Um, to <laughs> poker players. Yeah. And those guys got phone calls from the special master saying, you have to pay them back. So, like, no. And no. Uh, it's a difficult, it's like art restitution, you know? And these guys basically, I mean, some of them were like, fuck you. And, but I, I think most of them were like, it's not worth the hassle and, right. and ate the money. And which sucks because had, you know, let's say they won 20 grand at the table that night, you know, somebody else won 40, Brad paid this guy and somebody else paid the other guy. The other guy's money's fine. And the person who B Brad paid- Just depends pay. who paid out. Yeah, right. it's just bad luck. What, um, what makes a game legal or illegal? What was the crime of which- Molly Bloom was accused and off of which the premise of the film is based. So um, it is totally- It depends on the state or the, I, I don't know. Yes, every state is different, but for the most part, um, poker is legal. Like I can have a poker game in my house and there's nobody kicking in the door. Where it becomes illegal in New York, and I think this is true in Los Angeles and, and in California and in other states is- <laughs> when there is a third party taking money out of um out of the pot that isn't playing in the game so if you're so the charging, dealer this is the idea of a, a rake. rake yep so if you're raking you're doing something illegal and i think you can actually rake if you're playing in the game but people like molly weren't playing in the game so that's what she was are there player dealers there are not usually that... player dealers but there are host players guys who are like come to my house and no that's what i mean like pl like someone who plays and deals at the same time I'm no sure. no like so there will there will always be a dealer who's never playing the game yeah um it's it, the mayfair club was the last place that was sort of self dealt um where's what's that the mayfair club was the the club that was in rounders oh that yeah they called the chester field i think um which was the the original poker um, club in New York City down in the 20s off Park Avenue where I, I first was exposed to poker and it was when you were like 20 something uh, or younger late, <laughs> late teens early 20s 
and it was glorious. It was just great. There was <laughs> Late a poker game. Yeah. Um, there was a poker game every night. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Um, is the idea, uh, um, I'm getting to the final few questions. Sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, is the idea of a rounder sad or beautiful? Wow. That's a good one. Um, so in the old days when when there there wasn't this maybe in, define start out by defining what a rounder, rounder is is, is a is a poker player regular who makes the rounds and um you know goes from game to game and is a profitable enough player that he can beat the rake and makes a living off of playing poker and I think before uh, there became a poker industrial complex that was sort of profiteering off people's misery and going bankrupt and broke, um, it was there was something wildly romantic about the idea that you have a chosen profession that is an extraordinary skill because even though poker is becoming more and more algorithmic, there is art to this. There is reading people. There is gut feelings that are, you know, your spidey sense. Um, and I always found it incredibly romantic that if somebody, you know, Nixon financed his first uh, campaign through poker winnings from the Pacific. Like <laughs> there were people who were good at this and yeah. made a living honestly. And I, I always loved that. Um, and now that it has become corporatized and sponsored and all this kind of stuff. It's like any industry. It's so, um, it's so stacked against the little guy that when people tell me what they, that they aspire to doing this, I'm like, dude, do anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, unless you're selling the, the picks and the shovels, you're going to get crushed. That's a good metaphor. I mean, returning, Oh, returning to this sad, beautiful analogy, you think it, I'm not asking, I guess, whether you'd suggest somebody become a rounder. I don't think you would. I don't think anyone, um, I don't think now anyway, anyone would, would tell an 18 year old kid, you know, who's asking what he should be when he grows up that you should be a rounder. Um, where where would you, where does this fall? I mean, it's not also a clear cut spectrum, but being around or sad or beautiful. Um, in the old days, it was beautiful. Um, there was a romance to the lifestyle. There was something aspirational towards to living um, in a way that was not part of the sort of assembly line of of uh, American Manifest Destiny of getting your, you know, three jobs and just sort of sticking with them your whole life. Um, and I found it incredibly romantic. I also found it, you know, there was ingenuity to it. You had to, um, you had to find out where the games were because you couldn't just sort of log onto the computer and do it. You had to find out that there was a game at this country club and then you had to get invited to it. So you had to be likable and charming and there was wit and guile to this and it was there was something really magical about that back then and now it is, has become something else and it's funny that you say like what would i say to an 18 year old kid like i'm i'm i've got a 10 year old and a seven year old who are interested in poker and i want them to be interested enough that they are good at the game but i don't want them to be interested enough that they would actually consider playing it regularly um that to me, but you it. play it regularly. I, I I play once a week, you know. But like their rounders play every night yeah. and um, have a you know a, a return expectation of, of an hourly wage. Like they can sit yeah. down at the end of the year and say, "I made X number of dollars an hour." Right. Um, I would not. It, there are so many things that can go wrong, and so many better ways to spend your time. Like it's. It's a fabulous game. It's an incredible entree to a lot of worlds. It's a skill that's got some roguish charm to it. Like, get good at it. Just don't spend your time getting great. I read an interview with you, I think, or maybe it was, I think it was an interview with you where you sort of whimsically commented about how you bullshitted your way into a job at yeah. the Paris Review as a technology editor or something. 
How did you get mixed up with George Plimpton and the whole Paris Review crowd? So I had been working, I don't remember if it was some environmental organization, and then I I had gotten exposed to writing for the first time because I had studied physics and astrophysics and um, really saw my future or the only possible future or something that was related to the hard sciences. But particularly in those fields, the, they become so esoteric as you move up that like, you know, it gets to a point where like 40 people on earth know what you're talking about and it's a fairly lonely existence. So I sought some sort of application of science um, that had, you know, more intercourse with the world. And um, it just kept letting me get exposed to other aspects of things. And then instead of pursuing hard science, I sort of started writing about science. And then I ended up having to write something. And this is a testament to my Dalton education, but like I hadn't taken a writing class since 10th grade. <laughs> and there I was 24 years old. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I really like this. Yeah. So the advice I'd gotten from a friend was just immerse yourself in the world. And I think by that she meant, you know, read as much as you can, go take a class, learn this. And, you know, huckster that I am, I was like, oh, I'm just going to fake my way into this. Yeah. So um, I had reached out to a couple of friends in publishing and it turned out that the Paris Review was looking for somebody to sort of bring it into the 21st century. What is this, late 90s, early 2000s? This is 93. Two, three, something like that. Yeah. And they, they didn't have the internet. It was yeah. ten years later. There was no internet. The there, there it was early, was, early. This was early. This was when people were like, "Can you tell me about the internet?" And that yeah. was literally the line that I used on Plimpton when I, I got an audience with him, and I said, "The future." How did you at a cocktail party? No, no. We, there was a. They were looking for an editor who was computer savvy and all this kind of Before stuff. Before the days of LinkedIn. Yes, and um, I, I through a friend. God, it was probably Lizzie Gottlieb. Somebody I don't remember um, got me the interview, and I just walked in and I literally handed him my, you know, my resume, which probably had seven spelling mistakes on it, and like. But all of my scientific publications as like work I've published. Right. And he was just kind of laughing. And I was like, the future of your magazine, Mr. Plimpton, is the internet. Yeah. And he went, good God, man, you're hired. <laughs> and he hired me. Um, and the truth was like where I was a scientist and I could use a computer, I didn't know what the internet was. Right. So I went out and hired somebody to do my job for me. <laughs> And I just took my time there as like this unpaid internship and I learned everything that I could. So someone else was doing the internet aspect yeah. of this. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of Joe Mackin, you know, who's <laughs> a great guy, he's still around. Um, well, you were just under the tutelage and mentorship of, of, the of great George. Editors there. Well, not, not just George. I mean, George was sort of very, very much upstairs in his ivory tower, but like the editors there were the smartest people I'd ever met in my Who'd life. Who'd you work with? A woman named Elizabeth Gaffney who knew everything about everything. A great guy named Daniel Kunitz who's who's like a, a brilliant editor. Um, the sort of old hand at that time was a guy named James Linville who I think still to this day like has read every book ever written. Like these were really bright people who really cared about literature, who really cared about the future of little magazines and they, the important role they they served in finding unknown writers and you know, the Paris Review had pulled out of the, you know, the slush submissions like Rick Bass and all of these great writers. I just read a short story. Um, uh, the the legend of Pig Eye Reeves, the, you know, the boxing, yeah, sure. the boxing one. I so, think that, that was in the Paris Review. Uh, I don't remember, but the, no. the review, I mean, you know, the, the stuff that they have published and discovered is extraordinary. So these magazines that were running on fumes and goodwill and reputation- <laughs> Um, hell, making, hell of a trio uh, making, absolutely, <laughs> making yeah. absolutely no money and were you know in in perpetual peril it <laughs> felt like you were fighting the good fight and i was there just just to learn from just these observing people. and um, sponge yeah and i learned a lot i made a you know a ton of stunning like colossal blunders that to this day like 
still i cringe uh, i'll walk down the street and just like go, probably should have oh got God. you fired but <laughs> um there was i mean if not for the good graces of elizabeth gaffney but there was like one of my first assignments was to uh was to copy edit something and i don't remember it was, it was somebody's interview it might have been like <laughs> probably like ted hughes or something yeah um and he referenced the edmund spencer poem uh fairy queen mm. And there it is written in type F-A-E-R-I-E. And I grab out my fucking red pen and circle. And I'm like, that's not how you spell fairy. And, you know, these poor people had to pull me aside and be like, Andy, like, you don't know what you're doing. So <laughs> there was a there was a real, like, you know, load, shoot, aim kind of thing that I was doing. But I ended up being sort of a productive member of the community and I did serve some purpose with, you know, helping the technology aspect of it. And in the meantime, I became very close with George and George took a liking to me and I eventually ad admitted my, uh, you know, con, my con and that I was an imposter and he found it comically charming <laughs> and then you know of course he did <laughs> asked uh, me to write hilarious. something and then i wrote a short story and he was like you know good lord man this is terrible and then asked me to write something else and it was in the first person he was like you know you actually write this very well he was like you should write about yourself yeah and in the same way that he does yeah. and then he said what do you do and i said i don't know i play poker and he was like and then he got me a gig writing for uh, writing an article for Esquire, right? To write about an underground poker club, mm -hmm. and that turned into Poker Nation, and that was the beginning of my my career. That's interesting. Was were the office? I mean, offices. I, it was run out of his apartment on Fifth Avenue. Right? No, or, on Seventy Second in the East River, Five Forty One East Seventy Second. It's the last building. Did he live there as well? He huh. lived in the second and third floors, and the reviews offices were in the basement. Right. Uh, first With, floor uh, in the underground basement. basement or first. Floor? It was first floor, so there was an office where the editor sat, and then there was a basement um where all the interns and yo-yos like me sat yeah. and i actually had an office like i was the only one with an actual closed door office and it was the meter room well, how how did what made what made you so well, lucky because oh. it was like filled with asbestos and nobody else wanted it oh like, fair so, or um, maybe a special office for the technology yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, specialist so that was my that was my chair um but it was glorious i mean it was you know that was the golden age. Was it as definitely. lively and dis? I wouldn't use the word disorganized, but I've I've seen the pictures, I guess, of people running around the office. I, you know, I, it was exactly as you picture. It was fairly disorganized, and you know, like I, it's funny because I did say like the magazine survived on goodwill, and the truth was like when we answered the phone there, we didn't say Paris Review. We answered the phone Plimpton office. Yeah, because. Two of the staff members who were paid were paid by George as his personal assistants, but they were they were Paris Review editors. And you know, when we were fighting for for a short story, you know, Tina Brown would publish a a, a John Updike. You know, Updike's got a new short story, and Tina Brown calls and says, "I'll pay you twenty five thousand dollars for it." And then Plimpton has to call Updike and say. I'll pay you a hundred dollars, but I'll throw you a hell of a party. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how we survived. And everything was like, you know, just like spitting gum wrappers because George was the like the spokesman for McCallum. So all of our parties only had scotch. Yeah. Right? Like there was like there really wasn't McCallum. a bar. It was because <laughs> George would get it, you know, six cases of McAllen, and that's what we would serve. Right. So we were always broke, but it was just fighting the good fight, right? I mean, there was no better way to learn the business by being like, your job, Andy, is to solicit advertising, edit copy, read the slush, take out the garbage. Like that to, was yeah. It, it was the all all you know all on the cards. Yeah, it was just the best. It was just the best, and I, I'm. You know, and it's embarrassing because other people were actually really good at the literary aspect, and I didn't know anything at the time. But you know, I, uh, I've I hope I've made amends. But <laughs> how did George get himself appointed as fireworks commissioner of New York? What was that about? So I think that was largely an honorary title. It's funny I can see his book right over there, fireworks. <sighs> um, George was absolutely f just he was fascinated by fireworks oh, and the fat man thing the so in, yeah. the in the 
chair and the he, yeah yeah um he he was just he turned into not that he wasn't always but like he turned into a child around um fireworks just like jumping up and he down. just couldn't he couldn't control himself he loved them so much yeah. and um it was like my first week at the Paris Review and most of the editors had gone off to some estate of some friend of Plimpton's in Lake Como. And um, Casually? And they were doing something there. I don't remember what it was. And randomly over the lake, um, somebody started shooting fireworks. And the story goes, I wasn't there, but I think Kunitz told me the story that George, like after you know 18 scotches and everybody's hammered, he hears these faint pops and George knows these are fireworks. And he kind of looks up and you see this sort of the, the lights flickering off the, off the lake. And George apparently popped up in the middle of the night, dead of night on Lake Como and just starts running towards fireworks because he can't control himself and tripped over a lawn chair and this and that. And like my first meeting with George day one was when he came back from Lake Como and it was like his arm was a sling, in a sling. His face was like, you know, had had scratches all over it because he was such a child around fireworks that like his personal safety did not matter. Like right. if he could get to the fireworks before they stopped, he, he was going to get there. So George was, um, you know, a bit of a celebrity and I think somehow ingratiated himself with the Grucci family mm. who were the people who used to sponsor the fireworks and- in New York? In New York. And, for what? For New Year's or something? Uh, Fourth of July. Yeah. And um, George being George talked them into naming him Fireworks Commissioner of New York. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Andy, final, final question here. Who is George Plimpton to you? So my youngest son uh, is named George and George Ames Farish Bellin and George Ames- Plimpton. Um, I named my son after George because uh, I forget just the the sort of literary prowess and the editing and writing thirty something books. Um, George was, and I'm sure this is an antiquated term that's probably not appropriate to use a Renaissance man, like mm. a Renaissance person. However. Um, he knew so much about so many things and cared so much about so many topics um, that he was inspirational on like nine different levels, right? Mm. Just being around him, his breadth of knowledge, his concern for the earth, his his ability to help other people. We would go, we'd be walking through an airport and some random dude would spot him and be like, oh man, you're George Plimpton. And this was not a guy that you were going to spend your day with. And George would say, would you like to come have a drink with us? And all of a sudden we're drinking with, you know, Frank, who uh, is a plumber in Queens, but read, uh, you know, bogeyman. It was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and um, so George was a mentor. He's inspirational. And it's funny, like I was only there a couple of years. Like a lot of guys knew George better than I did, but I, I loved him. He got a tremendous kick out of me. Um, but there was also, there were all of these um, lessons to be learned just from observing him. It's like almost at a poker table where you're trying to figure out who's who. Like George, the, the way I write is very much an homage to George because he never took himself too seriously. Like he, there, there was not this I know he's always sort of equated with the sort of gonzo journalists and stuff, but like he did not take himself seriously. Yeah. There's a great line in Shadow Box where he was like talking about his prowess as a fighter because uh, he ended up fighting Archie Moore. Yeah. And um, he said, I, I was born with something called um, a sympathetic response, which means that whenever struck, I begin to cry. <laughs> and it was just that's who he was and how he lived his life. And um, I don't know, there was also the internship program at the review was very important. The fact that George was such a caring person that he could never fire anybody. Yeah. So like, even when he found out I was an imposter, he promoted me. So I was like, <laughs> he promoted me to a position that I couldn't do much damage basically, yeah. but he couldn't, he, just, he couldn't bring himself to fire anybody. Right. Just, uh, 
So I feel like there was, there were, um, there were examples of how to live one's life that George, either intentionally or unintentionally, presented to all of us at the review, and some of it stuck. So I don't know. George was somebody who meant the world to me, shaped my life, whether he meant to or not, by giving me the opportunity to present myself as something I I wasn't, but then challenged me to learn to become the thing that I had faked that I was. Right. And it was, you know, it was the most definitive experience. Yeah. Andy Bellin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it.